This is the fourth installment on the call to follow. Through the series, we have established a few thoughts that are important for us to keep through and keep following thoughts that are important for us to keep meditating on. As you follow the Lord, we did say that he molds you into the kind of son that he wants you to be. That's a process of making. We have looked at this in different ways and established that in the call to follow is a commitment to make. The Lord is committed to make you as you follow him. And so ideally, he gives that promise from the word God. He says, follow me, I will make you. And so uh, I, would, I would say this way. The call to follow the Lord is a call by the Lord to, be, to make you. It's him calling you to make you, to mold you, to build you, to shape you into the kind of son that you ought to be in him. Very important for you to understand that this thing is not just about you following him. As a matter of fact, if you just tweak your mind, just shift your mind and begin to think in terms of the Lord making you, begin to think in terms of the Father molding you into the kind of son that you ought to be, that will be the greatest motivation in following him. And so the greatest motivation in following is to be made. When you're conscious of what you're being made, and we'll be looking at that at a later stage. So we have established that he molds you in the kind of son that you ought to be, but he also equips you for the assignment he wills to engage you in. So again, the call to follow is a call to be equipped by the Lord to serve a divine purpose. It's a divine call, it engages divine molding, it involves divine equipping to the end that you and I can fulfill the divine assignment. So the whole thing is very divine. It's a divine transaction. It's a divine transaction. And so as you follow the Lord, as you pursue him, as you give yourself to do his will, we have established so far that what happens is in, in the Lord, you become a mature son produces you to be a mature son. Now, we cannot come to maturity without following. And these are things we have discussed in the previous three uh, installments. And I'll encourage you to take time and listen to them. Now, in the last uh, uh, installment, that's uh, part number three, we began discussing on the cost of following. Okay? We began discussing on the cost of following which I would want us to push a little bit further today. The call to follow is a call to lay down your life. You have to let go all to follow the Lord. It's, it's a complete surrender to Him. We looked at a few portions of Scripture, but allow me to just uh, draw your attention to a very interesting portion of Scripture in 1 Kings 19, verse 19 to 21. 1 Kings 19, 19 to 21. Look at, look at a man who receives a call to follow. It says, So he, that's Elijah, departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him, and he left the oxen and ran or ran after Elijah, and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. The man throws the mantle, and, the, and this other man hears the call. Okay? And he said to him, go back, for what have I done to you? What have I done to you? Go back. So Elijah turned back from, Elisha rather, Elisha turned back from him, and took a yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them, and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. It's the kind of sacrifice we're talking about here, the cost of following. He took the yoke, he took yoke of oxen, 
and he slaughtered them. Then he gave the people to eat. He disengaging himself from what was his occupation up to and including this point. That for which he lived. That for which he you know, laid his life down. That which was his pursuit. At this point, he lays it down. And he follows the man, Elijah. You are not ready to follow if you don't count the cost. To follow, there is something you must be willing to let go. Things have changed, have to change. The Bible says, and he became his servant. A call to follow is a call to serve. You see, if you really want to follow the Lord and walk with him, then you have to put on a mindset of a servant. The Bible talks that Jesus served as a son. Okay? Jesus was faithful as a son. Moses as a servant. You have to come to a place and appreciate that sonship is expressed through servanthood. True sons are true servants. And the call to follow is a call to serve. You follow him and you serve him. Paul says in Philippians 3, 7 to 8. Philippians 3, 7 to 8. Paul says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Look at the language. I have suffered the loss of all things. I count all things as rubbish. They have no value to me. Why? That I may gain Christ. And so, beloved, the call to follow, the call to follow, is a divine call and places a demand on you. It places a demand on you to place God first, to put God first in your life above all else. Says I've counted everything as loss. In fact, I consider it rubbish that I may gain Christ. When I look at these things in the light of Christ, I place more premium on Christ. And I'm willing to let go of everything that I may lay hold of Christ. That's what Paul is saying. That's what Paul is saying. I've committed myself to follow him. And whatever it takes, I'm willing to let go. In other words, I'm determined that nothing will stand between me and him. Nothing will distract me from him. I would rather lose all that is physical and visible and material. That I may lay him, lay hold of him who is eternal. Whom to know is eternal life. Now, it's a call. <clears throat> this call is a call to believe the Lord and put your undivided trust in him. And such a call, beloved, it places a demand on you and me. What is this demand? It is a demand to put God first in your life. It's a call to lay down your life, follow the Lord, and let him live his life through you. That's the price we must be willing to pay. The call to lay down your life, your ambitions, your pursuits, your selfish desires. Lay down your life. Your own will. Jesus said, I did not come to do my will, but the will of him who called me, who sent me rather. I came to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, he has a will, but he will lay it down to do the will of him who sent him. When he is about to face the cross, he says, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. Hebrews talks about what? That is, I have come. In the volume of book, it is written about me. I have come to do the will of the Father. That's what you're talking about laying down your life. When you choose to subjugate your will to the will of the Father, when you choose to subjugate, to submit, to subject your own will to the will of God, this is what I want, but I choose to do what he wants, not what I want. 
This is what I choose. This is what I desire. But I'm willing to lay it down. So that I can pick up what he desires. And I've been there many times, beloved. Where I have to make a decision. Am I going to lay down my will and do his will? Or what do I do? And each one of us is faced with that situation every day in life. Every day. You choose between your will and his will. The call to follow is a call to lay down your will. So that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So that you can say, not mine, but your will be done. That's what following is about. Is advancing his will, not your will. His agenda, not your agenda. You're following the Lord. And as you follow him, he is in charge. So you, you do his will. My friend, this is a call to die to self. It's a call to die to self. It's a call to lay down your life. Follow the Lord. And let him live his life through you. Now, you don't follow him and then lay down your life. No. Once you hear the call to follow, if truly you're willing to follow the Lord, know him, work with him, become like as he is, represent him effectively wherever you are. Ensure that through you, the kingdom of God comes on earth. That through you, the will of God is done on earth as it is in heaven. To come to that point, beloved, where he reveals himself to you in you and through you, when you hear that call to follow, the first thing you have to do is to lay down your life. By the saying, yes, Lord, you are laying down your life. It is after laying down your life that you follow him. I submit to you this morning that you haven't begun following him if you haven't laid down your life as yet. To the extent you have laid down your life, to that extent you are following him. You don't know his ways. You're not walking in his ways. You're not walking in his steps. As long as you're pursuing your will. Oh, I have my own will. You know? Oh, I have my own vision. Oh, I have my own ambition. Uh, this, this thing we call vision, sometimes it's more ambition. You have your own agendas. You have your own plans. You have your own goals. Things that you sit down and dream and desire to achieve and accomplish in life. This is what I want to be at 40. This is what I want to be at 50. This is what I want to be at 60. By the time I'm 70, I want to have accomplished this. And you have what I hear them call the bucket list. And at all costs, that's what you're following up. You have become the architect of your own life. I know someone will ask me, are you saying we don't plan? No. We plan, but we plan in the light of what we have seen in the Lord. You follow him, you lay down your life, you follow him. He shows you what he intends and desires to accomplish through your life. Then your plan is in that context by the help of the Holy Spirit. Just look at the life of Jesus. Following through the will and the desire of the Father. Very organized. He had a plan, but that plan is subject to the will of the Father. Look at the man, Paul, the great apostle. I mean, it's clear the man had a plan. He's very organized. But his planning is subject to the will of the Father. But if your plan is subject to your own will or to your own religion or, you know, or your own ambitions, then that is your will being done. We have come to the place, beloved, as we follow him, where we say, not mine, but your will be done. It's a call to lay down your life, to follow him, and let him live his life through you. Let him live his life through you. It is him working in you as you. While we see you do things, yet it is him in you. Praise the name of the Lord. It is him who causes you to will both to do his good pleasure. He's causing you both to will and to do his good pleasure. You've submitted yourself to him. Galatians 2.20 says, Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, that's a death sentence. The man is saying, I'm dead. I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's Christ in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, that's the life that you now see, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave me and gave himself for me. I live by faith in the Son of God. The life you see in the flesh, the expression of life that you see in the physical, that life is an expression of my confidence in the Son of God. I have faith in him. I believe him. I trust him. Now, the result of that trust in him is what you see as a physical life. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I don't live by my ambitions, by my agenda and plan. <clears throat> I'm no. I don't really say, I think I knew really what I wanted to be and to do even when I was a young man. I knew. I had my plan. I had my, my agenda. I had a notion about what a preacher is and who a preacher is, which was a corrupted mind. And I did not want in any way to be doing what I'm doing right here this morning. I did not want that. I had my own agenda. But following him means I laid down my agenda. I laid down my will and take up his will. Let him live his life. I live by faith, by putting trust, by putting confidence, by relying upon. Faith is unquestionable trust in, reliance on. Faith is subjecting to coming under. All right? Coming under. Arranging myself under the sun of the living God. Very important. I arrange myself under the sun. That's what faith is. Putting myself under the sun. And therefore the sun lives his life through me. Romans chapter 6, verse 8 to 11. Romans 6, 8 to 11, it says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall live by him. Okay? Verse 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Praise the name of the living God. He dies no more. That's why he says he's the first one from among the dead. He's the first one who died, rose again, and will never die again. That is what makes the covenant eternal. That's what makes the covenant valid. Hallelujah. That he in whom I believe will never die again. It's over. It's done with. Death no longer has dominion over him. About, you know, people struggling to understand when it says that he's the first one from among the dead. What does that mean? And yet Lazarus had resurrected. Lazarus resurrected and died again. Man resurrected, died again. He's the first one who resurrected and will never die again. He's the first one from among the dead. Okay? That's powerful, my friend. He dies no more. You see, a testament, or what you call a will, does not take effect until the testator, or the one who wrote the will, dies. Okay? He will say, my, my, this is what my children will be given, so and so, all that. It's called a will. The advocate can have it. It does not take effect until the man dies. Now, the covenant, the new covenant, could not take effect until Jesus died. We together. Now, after it took effect, he rose again to enable us to effectively fulfill and execute the same. And he'll never die again. Now, that simply means that will that he established, that covenant is eternal. And that's a lesson for another day. Verse 10 says, <clears throat> For the day that he died, he died to sin once for all. Now look at this. By the life he lives, he lives to God. Even him doesn't live for himself. Verse 11 says, Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the life that you now live, it is lived in Christ, living unto him. You are alive to God 
in Christ. So the life you now live, it is lived in Christ. That's following. You cannot follow him when you are outside of him. You follow him while in him. In him. And so, beloved, this call to follow is a call to lay down your life and abide in. Abide in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. That's a position. That's why you want when you follow. We follow in Christ. We follow him while in him. It's a mystery. We, are, we get into him, we lay down our lives, and in him we begin following his ways, his will, his wisdom, his counsel, following him. 2 Corinthians 5.15 2 Corinthians 5.15 And it says, And he died, that's Christ, for all, as Jesus. He died for all. That those who live, now, now listen to this, listen to this. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So he died that you no longer live for yourself, beloved, but you live for him who died for you and rose again. And therefore, it is very clear, none of us lives for themselves. The call to follow is a call to lay down your life. And allow him to live his life through you. For him who died for them and rose, I mean, sorry. And he died for all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves. You cannot claim to be following the Lord and you live for yourself. You live to fulfill your will, you live to fulfill your ambitions, you live to fulfill your dreams, you live to fulfill your desires. You cannot do that. That. If truly you are laying your life down, if truly you are following him, you have to lay your life down, and then your life is lived for him. Now, that doesn't sound like it's a good life, because there's no independence. There's no independence. When the Lord is calling you and telling you, follow me, he's telling you, give up independence. That is is where the challenge comes through. Give up independence. Because we don't want to give up independence. You don't want. We want to be independent. We want to do what we want, when we want. We want to be in charge of our lives. Listen, you cannot follow him and be the architect of your own life. To follow him, you have to let him to be the architect of your life. You have to do not your will, but his will. The call to follow Christ is a call to disengage from all and consciously, fully, and unreservedly submit yourself to him. It's a call to disengage from all. That's not it. From there, what do you do? You consciously, fully, and unreservedly submit yourself to him. Consciously, fully, and unreservedly. Consciously submit yourself. Fully submit yourself. Unreservedly submit yourself. You are gone. You no longer live. You don't exist. He lives in you. He lives through you. Then you can say like Paul, for to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. It's a call to embrace his life and leadership as your life. Very important. The call to follow is a call to embrace his life as your life. To embrace his leadership as your life. That you are willing and accepting for him to lead you. To direct you. To guide you. You are willing for him to be the, the one in charge of your life. It's a call to lay down your life. That's a praise you must be willing to pay. Now, the call to follow is a divine call to invest your life and all that concerns you to the Lord who owns both you and all you have. It's a call to invest your life and all that concerns you to the Lord who owns both you 
and all that you have. Matthew 9, Matthew 6, 19. Okay. We've established a call to lay down your life. Now we're talking about a call to invest your life to hit the Lord. You lay down your life, you let go all. You abandon everything. His life becomes your life. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In the early years of my faith and walk with God, this thing troubled me quite a, quite a lot. The scripture that really bothered me, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be yours. And I used to think the, 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 the writers had got it all wrong. Why would, why would they mess with English? I used to think it should be for where your heart is. That's where your treasure will be also. I used to think that where my heart is, that's where my treasure is. But I did not understand that the heart follows treasure. The treasure doesn't follow the heart. It's the heart that follows the treasure. She says, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So he says, if you want your heart to be in that which is heavenly, then put your treasure in the storehouse that is heavenly. But if you put your treasure in the storehouse that is earthly, because you see, it introduces here two treasuries. Okay, two treasuries. Heaven and earth. There are two treasuries. Heaven and earth. And you choose where to deposit. Now, to follow the Lord wholeheartedly, you have to choose to lay your treasure in heaven. It's a deliberate choice to invest in matters of the kingdom. The context here, ladies and gentlemen, is material resources. I like the way we spiritualize everything. And therefore, we don't bring out the realities of scriptures. The context here, ladies and gentlemen, is material resources. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't just think about the temporal. Don't lay for yourself treasures on earth, on the temporal side. Don't choose a treasury which is temporal and exposed to numerous kinds of dangers. In other words, do not be preoccupied with self-preservation. Very, very important to get. Say, so don't be preoccupied with self-preservation. I say, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Invest in heaven. Okay? So put your faith and trust in that which is eternal. Bringing in two aspects. The temporal and the eternal. The visible and the invisible. The natural and the divine. And it says, learn to invest in that which is eternal, which is divine, which is heavenly. Put your treasures, put your resources in the things that have to do with God. And that's where you get the context of Matthew 6, 33, which we'll be re reading shortly. That's where you get the context of it. Matthew 6, 33. You get the context of it there. So, but we like reading Matthew 6, 33, Void of 6, 19, 21. In fact, if you read the whole of this chapter 6 there, it talks about two treasuries. It talks about two eyes. And so and so forth. Very important. So to follow the Lord, you have to choose to lay your treasure in heaven. 
You must use your resources to worship the Lord. Use your resources to invest in Him. Listen, when He's telling you follow me, He is not calling you minus your material resources. The call to follow is a call to invest your resources in Him. I want to say this to you. What you believe in, you invest in. What you believe in, you invest in. That's why you don't struggle to put up anything for your children or for your wife or for your husband because you believe in them. Believe in them. That's why you have a lot of struggle even to give an offering where you go to church because you don't believe in that vision. You don't believe in that vision. So you have a struggle, a challenge, a problem investing. What you believe in, you invest in. That's what I'm simply saying. Do you believe me? Invest in me. Then the Lord is saying something big here. He says, if I can have your treasure, I will have your heart. I want you to understand what he's after is not your treasure, is after your heart. Because you do well to note that he owns both you and your treasure. He owns you and all that you have. He created you. You breathe his air. You are on his earth. He made it. So you have nothing. You own nothing. And you are nothing without him. You are nothing without him. You have nothing without him. You own nothing without him. And for him to remind you that, he constantly allows you to see people die and leave everything because they owned nothing. All you have, what you own, is what you carry when you die. If you're not going to carry anything when you die, then you own nothing. Job says, I came with nothing. I shall go with nothing. What a wise man. But you came with nothing, but behave as if you own everything. Except the Lord. You care much about what you don't own. You don't care about the one who, from whom you came. This is a call here. This is a call here. To live life the way it should be lived. He's telling you, pay attention to what matters. Turn your heart to what matters. And that's him. That's Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's him. That's Christ. You must be willing. The same verse is there. Matthew chapter 6. Like I've told you, there are those two, uh, two, two uh, treasures, heaven and earth. If you read, you'll talk about, you find two eyes, a good eye and an evil eye. It's there. Then there are two masters. Okay? A good eye, an evil eye. Two treasures, two eyes, two treasures, heaven, earth. Then he talks about two masters. Look at verse 24. Two masters. There are two masters, God and mammon. And you choose who to serve. Verse 24 says what? Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Then he goes on to say, you cannot serve God and mammon. Cannot serve God and mammon. <clears throat> so there are those two masters there. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. You have to be willing to let go one. Be willing to put your trust in one. Okay? Be willing to put your trust in one. And so, beloved, I want to challenge us to put our trust in him. To follow the Lord wholeheartedly, you have to elevate him above money and material riches in your mind. You have to love him. You have to value him above all else. Elevate him above riches, above material things and above money. You cannot serve God and mammon. I want to leave you with that thought today. Thinking about two masters, God 
and mammon. Which master are you serving? If you choose to follow him, the evidence is your, where you put your materials, material resources. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot claim to follow him, but you don't put your material resources in him. To follow the Lord, you have to be willing to invest your material resources in his kingdom. You have to be willing to invest in the kingdom. You have to be willing to finance his agenda. As a price, you must be willing to finance his agenda. Then you will value his agenda. Then you will value his purpose. Then you will value his will. And let me say this way. If you finance the gospel, you value the gospel. You don't believe in it if you can't finance it. What a man finances, where a man puts his coin, that's where his heart is. If your coin is not in the gospel, you don't believe in the gospel. If your coin is not in the agenda of the master, you're not following him. The call to follow is a call to invest in his kingdom. May the Lord give you understanding in these things. I bless you in Jesus' name.